Good morning. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Good? I'm going to go off center here because the whiteboard is going to be used today. So we got double visuals going. There you go. Coming high, coming low. We're going to go deep. Amen? We've been going through um, conflict resolution on Wednesday nights. And uh, session three was this past Wednesday, and I focused on the conflict within, because many of the conflicts that we are in in life usually can be avoided had it not been for our own issue. That's right. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. Sometimes we perceive things mm -hmm. that really aren't there. That's right. And it can cause us to go into a shell, or to avoid a person, or to have a grudge against a person. Am I hitting home? Yeah. Anybody say, yeah, man. <laughs> it hurts. It hurts. And for no good reason. The enemy is playing on something that's buried under your heart. Now, I had the, um, the opportunity to, uh, to be mentored by a man which went to, um, I believe it was Ashland University where he did his uh, theological studies um, Paul Goulet, and he did these, um, he went through a Christian counseling. Before he was ever a pastor of a church, he set up Christian counseling centers uh, all through uh, California, uh, and really was, was uh, used of God to heal many people um, internally. And one of his mentors, Dr. Richard Dobbins, uh, has a national radio program. He was one of his professors there. Uh, you know, I don't even, he may be retired by now, um, but a great man of God, I've had the opportunity to hear him speak. And he says this, you don't live with the facts of your life, but the interpretation of the facts. Hey, that's big. You don't live with the facts of your life, you deal with how you interpret the facts of your life. And a great way in which we interpret things is by what's hidden in our heart. Do you know Studies have shown you don't forget anything. You just may have a troubled time recalling events, but it's like a computer. Even when you delete something, the, the burned etching is still in that computer. Your mind is the same way. You forget nothing. So when things come into your life through what you're conscious of, it gets filtered through all that stuff that you've collected throughout your entire life. So we're going to go through this. 1 Corinthians uh, 13, 11, 12. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put childish things away. But now we see in a mirror or a glass dimly but then face to face, now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I am also known. God knows everything about you. Yes. When his perfection comes, you'll be known just as you are known. Can you see through this windshield very well? Foggy. It's very foggy, isn't it? What Dobbins is saying, basically, is that the events of your life cause you to see through a glass dimly. You know? You don't see the trees on the side of the road. You don't see the yellow line that's supposed to be here. You don't see the warning signs. Right. All you see is what you see dimly. So it's time to get down deep into our hearts, right? Amen. I'm going to give you an example before I even go to the next slide. I was watching sports recently. Now it's NFL playoffs and only what, eight teams get in the playoffs, right? So I'm watching ESPN, and at the bottom of the screen, I see scores going by. You, you know, they, they put up scores. And I see, I think it was D-A-L, which is the abbreviation for Dallas. And I see 41. And then I see second. So that means, in football, second quarter. 41, I'm thinking, wow, that's either a missed extra point after six touchdowns in the second quarter, or it's five touchdowns and two field goals. And then I'm thinking, wait a minute, Dallas is not in the playoffs. And then I looked all the way to the left, and there was a little thing that said NBA, 
National Basketball Association. Why did I think Dallas Cowboys football? Because in my heart, I'm a little more focused on football than I am basketball. It's no different with any area of your life. There are things pulsating under your heart that usually go back to your childhood. That's good. Come on. As a child, I used to do things like a child. As a child, when something happens, the human nature is, I'm going to cover over what happened because I don't know how to deal with it and I'm going to move on. Or I deal with it in a skewed way. I'm dealing with my pain in a skewed way. Does that make sense? Amen. And that could be a number of things. It could be, you know, one kid I knew growing up with had a lot, of, a lot of pain. Lost his father as a kid. His mother was mentally ill, became like schizophrenic, a different person. This kid was up in his window shooting BBs at cars. That's how he dealt with his pain. You know? His mother was put in a mental institution. You know? There are other kids in my neighborhood that ripped off car stereos. You know? I don't want to mess with those kids. Those are the bad kids, you know? Not justifying them, just saying. When there's stuff buried, it's alive, unless you deal with it. And to deal with it, you have to not do what the child does, you have to do what the adult does. And that's dig deep. Get through the asphalt that was paved there and get underneath. So we're going to go to what Dr. Dobbins calls the vat. The vat simply refers to the core, the center of who you are. What we've come to know as your heart. Now we're not talking about the organ pumping blood. We're talking the heart of who you are. That's the combination of your, your mind, your will, your emotions. And all these things make up the core of who you are. Matter of fact, many people take on an identity based on the situations that have happened in their lives. Right. You know, if someone, say, picked on as a kid or felt um, you know, uh, taken advantage of, as they get older, they might do something to protect themselves. They might lift a lot of weights and get big, and they feel like, I can protect myself now. I can stand up to the bullies. But then, all of a sudden, they become the bully that they once disdained. Mm -hmm. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Or they might get into boxing or martial arts. No, anyone messes with me, I'm going to, you know, take it out on them. And now they've got this identity of the tough guy, because really, they were weak and vulnerable at a point in their life. Amen. Make sense? Yeah. yeah. You know? Some women that have, say, felt rejected by their fathers or by men in general, they get attention in lots of different ways, don't they? Right? How they dress, how they look, how they act, where they go. We all have that potential. Does that make sense? Amen. What Dobbins is saying here is that there are many things buried that we're unconscious of. So you see here he has your conscious, and that's information coming in. Things that are people saying, things you observe, things you perceive, right? In the unconscious, this is the stuff buried in your vat or in your heart. As things come in, it's going to get filtered through all these things, and then when it comes out, you've got a distorted interpretation of what took place. Come on. If I am an insecure person, and someone says to me, um, I'm expecting to go up to them and have a conversation, like, hey, Mike, how you doing? And they walk away. How am I going to interpret that? As if you're being rejected. Bingo. They might not have Bingo. They may not have heard you, or they may have an emergency they're going to. Right. It may have nothing to do with me. But we make it about ourselves because of that pulsating thing, that bleeding ulcer in the heart that's full of pus. And unless you and I get the pus out, we'll always be dealing with those things. So here's my heart. I got this vat, right? That's my heart. And in there, I got some cool things that happened in my life, some positives. Hey, I was part of a championship athletic team. Why do I say that? Because that's important to me, or was important to me, right? You know, uh, positive. Hey, I went to a, um, you know, a Division I school, and I played football. I walked on. I did some, you know, some things I'm proud of, right? And then I got this thing that happened. Was rejected. Felt abandoned was wrongly accused of something, right? Had people say things about me. 
No one in this church, of course. People looking around. Like, I was going to talk to him, but I thought you did when he said that. <laughs> but, no, you know what the, the fact is? Pastor and I, in a place of authority, will have people... Uh, and, and I'm not suspecting again, not anybody, you know, and it could be though, but there could be at any point someone that comes in the door have an issue with us simply because we're authorities. Amen. Because what? Authorities took advantage of them. And as this goes unattended, it festers. Yep. Unforgiveness, lack of trust, right? These are the offshoots, and we're going to get into this in a minute, of, of what I believe David called iniquities of the heart. Amen. So, unless I address these things, I'm always going to go wayward, and any time I perceive something that goes in here, it's going to come out distorted. That's right. A distortion of the truth. Now, can it be someone is doing something wrong to you? Absolutely. But what we talk about in conflict resolution is there's healthy ways of confronting that right. and making your need known. You know, um, little Bella, <laughs> Stephanie's daughter, she likes to get the, the bullseye of the uh, communion cups. And so do I. Because <laughs> my, my prayer is when I take that is like, God help me to walk in the center of your will. So in conflict resolution, <laughs> Now, I specifically didn't take the center one because I knew she liked it. I took the one closest to the pulpit on the rim. Anyway, because it was easier for me to get. So she came up, and the center one was gone. So she said to me, very conflict resolution, she says, when the center cup is gone, Pastor Mike, I feel... <laughs> I said, very good, but I didn't take the center cup. I said, and when I'm wrongly accused, I feel rejected and intimidated. And she says, and when I've wrongly accused you, I feel very sorry. A work in progress. Amen. Things that we say. Wow, did I jump? I did jump. All right, I jumped a lot. <laughs> All right, things that we say and do do impact people, don't they? Don't they? But fear is false evidence appearing real. That's right. Where's Terry? Oh, Terry had to go. Yeah. Terry, a few weeks ago, thought her car was stolen from a funeral parlor. They said, oh, it's in the back. And when she got to the back... It was valet. It wasn't there. It's like, where's my car? So it was a Wednesday night. She came in. We prayed. My dad says, what funeral parlor? I know that. I, was, I know what, what they do with those cars. Sometimes they go on the back street, which is in the back. But it's behind these hedges on the street. So if you don't know any better, you don't know your car is there. So... My dad found the car. I got the keys from Terry. You know, we got in the car and, and took it back to the church, you know. But it's false evidence appearing real. And that's what happens in the vat. It's not true, but now I have a conflict because I perceive that this person's wronged me. Maybe someone is upset with you. Maybe you did something to them. Me? Never. Lord, I am perfect before you. My motives are always right. Maybe the issue is with you. So maybe if there's something, you know, one of the things we teach in the conflict is maybe you go to that person and say, hey, I've noticed um, we're not the same right now. Is there something that I've done? I'd, I'd like to give you the opportunity to tell me. Anything wrong with that? No. No. Now, the responsibility is on them. You have taken the knee and said, I'm, I'm at your disposal. Please tell me, because I'm your friend. Amen. Right? That's, in general, what you're saying. You know? You're my aunt. You're my friend. Whatever the case is. Now, if you're sitting here going, how come Pastor Mike didn't say I'm his friend? <laughs> you're dealing with rejection right now. <laughs> Have I wronged him in any way? <laughs> eh. 
issues of the heart, conflicts can occur because we do not see the full picture of the situation because we do not see the full picture of who we are. Boy, that'll hit you in the face, won't it? And here you got this blurred image of this gal looking in the mirror. Part of it's because our DLP doesn't project <laughs> properly. <laughs> but you've got to understand yourself. Why do I think the way I think? Why do I do the things that I do? What's underneath this system called the heart and soul of who I am? Am I making sense? Yes. Are you guys in deep thought? Yeah. I'm smelling smoke. That means you're thinking. That's good. Newsflash. Those things in your heart are not unlike children. They are your responsibility. And that's sad because there are many things that many people face that were not done to them by choice. It was by someone who had authority. It was done to them by someone whom they loved and trusted. But it's your heart. Yeah. And you're stuck with it. That's right. When I was a child, I did things like a child. But now that I'm an adult, i got to do what an adult does in dealing with this. We're gonna, you know, here's the, th here's the good news. I'm not just going to give you awareness. I'm going to give you some practical tools that you can take home with you. And it can start even right here after the service. All right? See, whether you or someone else chose to put them there, they're your responsibility. And that's a tough truth. Now we've got roots and fruits. Negative events will skew your interpretations of reality. Right? even cause blind spots. You may not even know it's there, but everybody else that knows you knows it's there. I was upset with somebody in my life who exposed truths about me, issues that I had, and I was like, no, I dealt with that. Who are you to tell me? The guard went up. Pride rose up. And I stopped associating with that person. Till the Holy Spirit showed me that person was absolutely right. And I'm like, dear God. You know, I was sharing on Wednesday night, there was a point in my life, and this is why I thought I dealt with the whole thing. I went through a, um, a breakup with a girl. that This was like a early, early years in ministry. Uh, we were on and off for like three years, but I was really attached to her. But I knew she wasn't going to be my wife. So I, I broke up with her several times, and the last time I broke up with her, she really took it hard. But in my heart and soul is, she was always connected to me and we would always have a chance to get back. But then, you know, I told her, let's just be friends. And as a friend, she called me and told me she had a boyfriend. <laughs> when she went off to California. <laughs> I was coming undone. <laughs> the connection was snipped for good. Right? Began writing an email. <laughs> But I never sent her, <laughs> thank God. <laughs> then the Lord confronted me. And he pulled up in the spirit, like literally it looked like a hand was under why I have roots and fruits here. Two roots, long tree roots. And on one of the roots was written loneliness. The other root was written fear of rejection. I could see them. Like not in my mind's eye, like here. And then they disappeared. And I said, I said, God, I, I don't have a problem with rejection. I go, everybody likes me. He goes, yeah, because you make them like you. He goes, you have a fear of rejection. And I said, Lord, I, I don't have a fear. I'm arguing with God. I don't have a fear of rejection. And then he, in my mind's eye, three photographs in a split second. Childhood, adolescence, adulthood. <laughs> Affirming those things. It felt like the floor came out from under me and the roof fell in. It was a truth I wasn't ready to handle in my life. For a month, I felt like God's hand was in my heart, rewiring my heart. Now, for that month, I was going through this freedom from the fear of rejection. Now, I had come this far, and I thought, hey, that's the most progress I've had with this, so I felt like I was there. But I had, like, this far to still go. That's why on this side of time, the person that said, you're dealing with that, and I'm like, 
No, I'm not. I've gone through that. And it wasn't until later on the Lord said, that person was 100% right. You were still dealing with it. I still needed to clean this guy out. There was stuff way down in my heart. Way, way down. Little things that were still alive. Sapping me of energy. When I got healed of the fear of rejection, lids came off my life. Lids came off my life. Praying, preaching, everything just changed. Instantly. Because what was God doing? He was taking out his magic, his magic eraser, and he was going, healed, 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 healed. The events are still there, but we're going to talk about it in a minute. I was able to now reinterpret the events as an adult. I didn't allow them to live and put pus in my heart and soul. All right? Negative events will skew your interpretations of reality and cause blind spots. Hurtful events and or interpretations will often lead to unholy and unhealthy actions. We talked about it. Some people run to substance abuse. Some people run to illicit relationships. Some people run to gambling. Some people, you're going to act out. Why? To anesthetize those things that you don't even know are there or understand. Yeah. And the momentary act of whatever it is you're doing appeases that, but only momentarily. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Does that make sense? Now these actions can lead to iniquities of the heart. Iniquities take deep root and typically bear bad fruit. And this works vice versa. If I've got iniquity, it's going to bear bad fruit. And the more I keep bearing that bad fruit, the more it affirms and strengthens the iniquity. That's right. Turn to Psalm 51. Now this is David praying after he had been found to be in sin. Prophet Nathan had confronted him of his adultery and, and his murder of his adulteress's husband by putting him on the battle lines. So Psalm 51 is all about David's prayer, repenting to God. But here's what he says, and this is something that I add to this teaching of Dr. Dobbins, because it makes a lot of sense. David says, wash me thoroughly of my iniquities and cleanse me of my sins. So what's the difference between an iniquity and sin? We've already kind of given to you. If I've got a tree here, right? I've got this nice tree. I think uh, Cassie did it the other night, um, drew the tree, and it was a lot better than this. But we're going to just say, this is our tree, and it's got lots of branches. Okay? Let's have a Winnie the Pooh uh, hole in the tree. Nice, nice. So this tree is going to bear fruit on it, correct? And these might be apples. Someone said, I called them apples the other night. Someone said, no, they were cherries on Cassie's tree, whatever. How does this be born? Oh, it gets sap through the tree, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Sap runs up and it produces this fruit. So, where does the sap come from? Wow. These long things called roots. Now, if I'm rooted in God's Word... Touchdown! The fruit that I bear in my life is going to be good fruit. Right? right? Amen. But if I've got roots that have rejection written on them, depression written on them, abandonment written on them, what kind of fruit's going to be on that tree? Bitter fruit, hurtful fruit. What? The fruit tells me something has to change. Right? Mm -hmm. You still arguing with people from your past? In your head? No. Yeah. No. I do. And when I do, I go, wait, time out. I need to forgive. Because the fruit just reminded me of where my roots are. The event doesn't change. 
how I deal with it changes. That's right. And how I deal with it changes the fruit. That's right. From a man of carnality to a man of the Spirit. That's right. So if I've got this event that happened and I'm still arguing with someone in my head, I go, time out. Lord, help me understand this. And you know what? I can't change that. But what I can do is forgive that person. That's right. God, I release them. What they said or what they did or whatever the thing is. I totally... And you know what? Wherever they are right now, Lord, in their life, God, I pray you're using them to bear good fruit for your kingdom. God, even if it was their issue, I pray that they are healed, that they're set free. God, I pray if they don't know how to get free, that you would lead them to a book or a person that will help enlighten them on how to be free. Amen? Now, this is the kind of message you're sitting here today going, oh, well, if only Brother Billy was here today. You know who is here today? You. 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 And there's a reason why you're here today. <laughs> then God has issues with me? <laughs> I'm out. <laughs> Does God love you? Amen. Yes. That's truth. Amen? Moving on. Clean the cup. So we're already into the how-tos, okay? Clean the cup. Matthew 23 is a, um, is a chapter where Jesus is probably the most unfriendly that I've ever seen Jesus. Matter of fact, after high school, me and my dad went out to Las Vegas because I was contemplating of going to the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. So I wanted to take a trip out there. And when I did... I was in the hotel room and I pulled out the Bible. At this point in my life, I was not walking with God. I was not seeking God. But I happened to just pull out the Bible. You know, at this point in my life, I could literally count how many times I read the Bible, probably on two or three fingers, you know. I happened to open up to Matthew 23, and he is absolutely, Jesus is lambasting the religious leaders of the day, calling them whitewashed tombs. He says, you put the burden of, of all these people to lift houses on their back and you don't lift a finger. He says, you do this, but you don't do that. You're Israel's teacher, and you're like whitewashed tombs. On the outside, you look great, but on the inside, you're full of dead men's bones. Wow, this is the first time I'm, this is my like, real exposure to, to reading the Bible. I'm like, what am I? <laughs> but he says in that passage, in verse 26, he says, First clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside will be clean. That's right. And he called him a hypocrite several times in that passage. Hypocrite! First clean! The inside! What's the cup? Well, I read it to you to open the service today before we got into worship. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. Right? My cup runneth over. The cup is... the vat. Your heart. That's your cup. You gotta clean it. So how do you clean it? So let's get into this. How are we doing on time? Anybody want to run home to their mommies? <laughs> Confront your past. Mark chapter 4, Jesus has given this great parable of the seed that the sower sowed. And he said, some fell by the wayside and the birds came and snatched it up. Some fell among stony ground and it sprouted immediately with joy, but because it had no root, the sun came up, scorched it, withered away. Some fell on... Thorns and thistles grew up, but then it was choked out by the, uh, by the thorns and thistles. And some fell on uh, good soil where it bore 30, 60, 100 fold fruit. Okay? So when the disciples came to him, they said, well, explain to us this parable. We don't get it. When he talks about the stony ground, that's where this verse 17 is. He basically says, because they had no root in themselves, they withered. So, to clean out the cup, I've got to establish root within myself. Right. I've got to know who I am. Mm -hmm. I've got to be real with the events of my life. I've got to be real with my failures. I've got to be real with the times I was taken advantage of, or at least thought I was taken advantage of. Okay? As I do that, I go deeper with myself. I get an understanding with myself. And with God in the midst of that, I get strengthened, and my roots go in God not in fallow ground. That's right. Amen. Is that coming at you? It is. 
Well, I'm 68 years old, Pastor Mike. And? Maybe time's gotten away from you. Maybe you still have time to look in and reestablish those roots in God even greater than what they already are. And maybe in these latter years of your life might be your best fruit ever. Amen. Amen. Something else you can do to clean the cup? Reinterpret memories from an adult perspective. Let's go to Genesis 45. Genesis means beginnings. And that is the first book of the Bible. Amen. All right. Everybody know, well, if you don't know the story of Joseph, he was basically thrown into a well by his brothers because they were jealous of him. Then they said, oh, let's not leave him for dead. Let's sell him into slavery. Right. Joseph goes and gets sold into slavery into Egypt. But he's put in charge of one of the master's houses. But while he's there, the master's wife wants to put the make on him. He runs, but she grabs his robe and uses it as proof to say that he put the make on me. So Potiphar, the, man, uh, the husband of the woman, puts him in prison. But while he's in prison, he gets this place of being like the prison warden. Eventually, he has this ability to, uh, well, you know, he had the ability to interpret dreams. So, he, Pharaoh has a dream, and now he interprets that dream, and Pharaoh, and he, and he gives him the wisdom and how to make sense of the dream and how to govern the land. So, Pharaoh says, you'll be um, second in charge to me, and no one other than me will have charge over you. So, Joseph becomes this success in Egypt. Now, there's a famine in the land. And his brothers are sent up by his father to come to him. And he recognizes them, but they don't recognize him. And at first, he's a little sharp with them. But he finally reveals himself over a number of interactions. And in verse 45, 5, you want to talk about reinterpreting the events of your life. Now, time out. If I'm Joseph, guess what, son? <laughs> You're going to jail. You are going to feel what I felt. You go and eat that slop. You go and live in those conditions. Not knowing when you're ever going to get out. This is what Joseph did. Talking to his brothers. But now, do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life from this famine in the land. Imagine that. And then in 5020, a lot of us Christians have gotten accustomed to saying, what the enemy meant for harm, God turns for good. And it's based on this verse. He says it again, but as for you, you meant evil against me. But God meant it for good. In order to bring it about as this day, so to save many people alive. Are you kidding? Do you think he's interpreting as an adult? Yeah. Yeah. Shake your head up and down. Yes. Yes, he is. Confront your past and reinterpret the events as an adult. I went through a tough rejection based on my own fear of rejection. But guess what now I do? I help people get over the fear of rejection. Because I handled that snake. Understand? Yeah. Okay. Number three. Process charged memories through prayer. Proverbs 4.23 says, Your heart is the wellspring of life. Guard it. Or guard your heart for it is the wellspring of life. I want fresh water in my heart. My cup I want to run over. Not with pus. Not with bitterness. Which grows up and defiles many. Not with sarcasm. Not with cynicism. I want my heart to be pure water. How is it, James asks, out of the same well comes salt water and fresh water? This should not be so. Right? Mm -hmm. Kick yourself in the shin because it's not me doing it. <laughs> Guard your heart. I want fresh water in there. So through prayer, I can say, God, help me not only reinterpret these, help me, re uh, help me reinterpret my past, but God, now flush out 
the impurities, flush out the pus, flush out those negative charges, and turn them into positives. Amen. Amen. Seek help from friends, spiritual leaders, counselors. Proverbs 15.22 says, There's wisdom in a multitude of counselors. Don't suffer in silence. If you're suffering, let somebody know, someone that you trust. You know, I was talking to someone just over the phone the other day. Um, they live in Massachusetts. And they were saying, well, I don't want to, you know, gossip about this person at my church. So, basically, I've not said anything to anybody. And I said, gossip is a spiritual thing. Gossip is the intent to defame somebody's character. I said, if you go to someone that you trust is not going to spread what you're saying, that's not gossip. Right. That's where your heart is. You're trying to bring resolution. I said, the family of God is a place where you should be cared for as well. And if there's something going on repeatedly like this, there may be an issue there. Don't suffer in silence. Let it be known. At least get it out. You know? Which is another thing that you can do. A lot of times these negatives can be turned into positives. What does a positive look like? A cross. Oh, Jesus, put the cross at the center of my heart. On the cross, Jesus said, Forgive them, Father, they know not what they do. If someone's hurting you, they're walking in darkness, whether intentionally or maybe unintentionally. Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. I know if they know you. I know if they loved you. I know if they were transformed by your love, they wouldn't be doing this to me. So I choose to forgive them. Does it mean I have to trust them? No. Forgiveness is granted. Trust is earned. Amen. You know? Someone, someone keeps punching me in the face. <laughs> I'm not going to step in range of their punch. Of their right hook into the kisser. Right? right. I don't have to stay there. That's right. Stages of forgiveness. Because I just want to touch on this and we'll pretty much wrap things up here. How many are tired? Are you ready to go home? Be honest. Don't suffer in silence. <laughs> You're up late, okay. Then you need to forgive me. <laughs> the Bible says you have to. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. That's called manipulation <laughs> that I just did to him. No. Thank you. Stages of forgiveness. There's three stages of forgiveness. One is the act of forgiveness. I have to choose to forgive that person. That's tough to come to sometimes, especially when you're hurting. But that starts the engine. Now, I'll skip stage two and go right to stage three. Stage three is the state of forgiveness. Stage two is the process. I know I'm in the state of forgiveness, and I've gone through the process of forgiveness, if... When I see that person, hear their name, think of that event, think of those words, and I don't get bothered by it. That's right. I've now reached the state of forgiveness. If it still bothers me, I have to keep going through the process and declaring to God, I forgive them, I pray for them, God, I choose to love them, regardless of who they are, regardless of what they've done. And Lord, yeah, I'm not going to be foolish and, 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 and set myself up for failure and put myself in that situation again. But I do forgive them. Forgive them for they know not what they do. Or they didn't know what they did. Here's something you can do. Write a letter that you'll never send. Get it out. Yep. If you don't have anybody you can trust with this information, this hurt, this perceived thing, Write it out. Type it. Write it. Preferably write it because you can throw it right in the fireplace when you're done. <sighs> right? Give it to your pastor. <laughs> give it to your pastor. <laughs> I'm not gossiping about them, Lord, or your pastor, but here, read that. <laughs> you got issues. <laughs> and then conflict resolution is deliberate discussions. You know? We've gone through that. Um, uh, uh, I went through like six or seven A's of getting an A in conflict resolution. You know, and, and one of them is you know, basically having, analyzing the situation and discussing it. 
I can discuss the issue without it being a fight. Right. If I'm angry, it's probably not a good time to have a, a deliberate discussion. Because <laughs> there might be a deliberate jab. <laughs> you hear what I'm saying, though? Do what David did in the Psalms. He'd talk about his enemies. Oh, God, kill them, rip them apart, or, you know. But then in person, you can talk with them reasonably and coach you and them right through the issue. Establish, I'm your friend, Dave. You know that. But there was something that you said the other day that offended me. And I have to, I just want to make sure that, you know, when you said I have hair growing out of my ears, what did you mean by that? <laughs> but what have I done? I've allowed him to know that he offended me without accusing him. I just remind him of what he said. I didn't go, you made me mad. No, he's not responsible for my anger. Come on. Amen. You are responsible for your anger. That's right. He's not responsible for my depression. I'm responsible for my depression. That's right. Yeah. Right? Yeah. He didn't make me pick up the pulpit and throw it into the wall. I chose to pick it up and throw it into the wall. That's right. That never happened. <laughs> Did you guys have a meeting on Tuesday night? No, no. <laughs> I didn't tell him he had hair growing out of his <laughs> And there's the truth. It was my own insecurity. Does that make sense? As you're sitting here today, you know what, why don't we bow our heads? You know what, Jimmy, if we can cue in a minute, the, um, just cue up the, uh, the river. The river. The song, the river. <laughs> we're, not, we're not having an actual river come through the doors and <laughs> wash it away, but we do want to get in the river and get cleansed. Amen. Does that make sense? It does. So I want you to just bow your heads, and I want the Holy Spirit to pinpoint things in your heart. These things that have become lids these things that have caused pus, anxiety, hurt and anger. The ability to not trust. Authority issues. What are these things? Someone you perceived had wrong motives? And maybe it was your issue? With every head bowed and every eye closed, Holy Spirit, continue to do what you're doing. And I, I just want, without anybody looking, if God is pinpointing something or has given you kind of a, a visual or a reminder, I just want you to signify that by raising your hand. Got a lot of hands going up. A lot of hands. Absolutely. These things need to be dealt with. God wants to free you from that. And so, you know what, Jimmy, as you put on um, the river song, I want to give you freedom to get beyond this. I want our prayer team to be up here. If you want someone to pray with you through this issue, and you want to get on the road to freedom, I want you to come up during this song. You know, maybe you just want time alone with the Lord. You can sit in your seat and allow the Holy Spirit to minister to you there. You want to come up to the altar, stand with your, your hands raised, or, or kneel. However you want to do it, allow the Holy Spirit to get in there. You know, if you need to refer back to the video, we're on um, NBCCRI.com. Go back. Hear these things again. Revisit them during the week. Now, Father, take us to the river, Lord. Give us the ability to forgive. Give us the ability to reinterpret these events the way Joseph did. To trust, God, that you'll turn the negative into a positive. Somehow, some way. Lord, it might be impossible for me to, to think how that can be possible. But I trust you. And I know you can. Jimmy.